very happy to invite you or to present on behalf of the second keynote speaker on Abra, Abra Bryn, who, if you're interested in knowing more about Abra, we just did a recent podcast on the Center for Local Prosperity's website, and I would encourage you to go listen to it. So today, our, uh, I shouldn't have run down the stage. Uh, today, our topic is weaving land, marine, and indigenous food systems. A little bit about Abra. Abra grew up on a farm. We talked about it last night. She is a farm kid, which developed a deep, deep love of agriculture. She grew up on a farm in the Okanagan Valley. She has been involved in community-based food systems for most of her life. She's naturally respected for policy as an analyst and for looking, working on sustainable food systems. And she has also worked on integrating indigenous food systems and sustainable fisheries. So she's a pretty amazing lady we got here today. The session is going to be about the fact that many in rural and particularly remote communities retain the practices of our ancestors for securing life essential for the landscapes and waters around them. Nevertheless, our food systems are dominated by globalized food chains and monopolies. Hence the reason that we spent a lot of time making sure all the food that came in here today was from Atlantic Canada and from small farms and producers. So without, without the, any more talk by me, I would love to present this thing. Oh. <laughs> Actually, can you advance the slides for me if I just say next? Oh, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to touch this. It seems like it might be radioactive or something. Good morning, everyone. It's an incredible honor and pleasure to be here. And I was quite thrilled, actually, when um, Bob reached out and we started a conversation last spring to, for me to be here. Um, and I owe that to Linda, who suggests that I should be here. Land acknowledgements are being more widely done across the country, and I think they're really important, but I also really want to recognize that so many Indigenous people are pretty frustrated by how token they are. But I think it's really important. I've spent a lot of time, I, I moved here to do a PhD, so I'm actually living in Chpuktuk, and I'll be there for eight months. And I've spent a lot of time walking around uh, the city. And I know the city is, well, cities are places where Indigenous people have been since time immemorial, and they are there now. But just being with my feet on the ground in this part of the, the planet has been really important for me. And I have the privilege of taking a course with Dr. Sherry Pictou on Indigenous governance and water. And she's been exposing us to a lot of great thinking and um, ways of life from the, of the Mi'kmaq people going back since time immemorial. And for that, I'm very grateful. Normally, I live in the overlapping territories of the Sinaixt and the Tanaha. And in addition to just saying to you where I live, whose land I'm a squatter on, they are... Um, they both have really interesting and important stories to tell. So the Tanaha actually have quite a large um, territory that encompasses uh, parts of southeastern BC, Alberta, Montana, and um, Idaho, I think is the next state over. Uh, they are an isolate language group. There's no other people on the planet that speak their language. I can't begin to attempt to speak it myself. My mouth is still trying hard to learn to put all those consonants together that seem to be common in a lot of Indigenous languages. But they have uh, been hugely impacted by, in particular, the um, Columbia River Treaty and the flooding of all those valley bottoms and their important places. And the Sinaixt are um, equally compromised, actually, by the Columbia River Treaty. And because as the Canadian and American governments were coming together to negotiate that agreement, there were these pesky people in the way. And if they did a census in the 1950s and discovered, lo and behold, they're all south of the 49th parallel, because that's where they were at that time of the year. And so they were able to declare them extinct. 
they weren't extinct. They aren't extinct. They continue to live and practice who they are all across their traditional territory, which includes where I live. And some of you may know that um, the Colville um, Sinaiks sent a man up, Richard Desotel, who hunted a moose out of season on purpose to basically push the point, we are here, this is our practice, this is our food, this is our space, and happily the Supreme Court of Canada agreed. Not that they should be the final arbiter of whether or not Indigenous people exist, but it's, it's what it is. So that's where I come from, this is where I am now. I also spent enough time with Indigenous people to know that I need to tell you who I belong to. So I am actually, depending on which side of the family you come from, I'm a third generation, second generation, third generation settler. My mother was born in Plum Coulee in Treaty One territory in Manitoba, as was her mother. They were refugees, they were um, Mennonite refugees from Russia. And on my, on my father's side, uh, he and his family, well, his, his ancestors left um, Alsace, uh, Alsace terrain, I think it's called, a part of Germany, they're French English or French German together, originally landed in the United States. And they went up to um, Saskatchewan and farmed there in Treaty 6 territory. And then through the 30s, both of my parents' families basically couldn't survive even on farms. They were starving to death and they ended up landing simultaneously in the Okanagan Valley where they started to work on farms there and built a family. So that's who I belong to. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit of a story of the food shed that I grew up in, not because it's an ideal and nothing can be replicated. It's so good to learn from each other but we need to not chase the next bright, shiny thing thinking that's the solution because there just isn't one and it's so particular to place for so many different reasons. But I think there's something to be learned from what I've seen in the food shed I grew up in and the changes that have happened in the last six decades because I'm 61 somehow already. Next slide, please. So this is most of my family. I was the eighth of 11 children. I was the runt. Happily, they didn't drown me at birth. Um, we all were on a farm, as um, Jillian said, and we each did, we were each obligated to do work according to our capacity. So we had five acres of tree fruit. We had an enormous garden, and there was also wild spaces on our farm. So I spent a lot of time mucking about in, um, bogs and climbing trees and picking up prunings and moving irrigation pipes and picking, picking, picking. We also did a lot of harvesting. The thing about growing up on a farm that's that diverse is from my very beginnings in every cell of my body, I knew what real food was. I knew what good food was. I knew how to eat seasonally because with a family of 13, you grow a heck of a lot of your own food, you figure it out, that's how you um, can afford to do that. And so um, I learned from a very young age what good local real food is, and also how important it is to spend time outside and have that um, feed your soul. Next harvest, next harvest, next slide. <laughs> the apple harvest. So um, to subsidize our farm and our family, my dad actually also had a concrete business. And so he um, used the infrastructure of that business, namely the truck to move our apples. We were part of the Vernon Fruit Union, which was a um, farmer co-op and it provided enormous services. So we purchased our own boxes, but they provided those giant bins and they had a controlled atmosphere storage so that our apples could go in there and, and retain that incredible quality and then be released to the market and also to us in February when you know nothing seemed like it would ever taste fresh again and you bit into an apple that was juicy and crisp and incredible. 
that fruit, fruit union had a range of different um, facilities that enabled the aggregation, the processing, the, the grading of all those different apples. They also found markets for us. So the grade one apples, of course, went straight into people that shoved them in their faces. But there was also um, that there, it, because the Vernon Fruit Union and other similar uh, organizations existed, the Okanagan saw the creation of fruit leathers and apple juice and all kinds of things like that. And so that's where our cull apples went. And at that point, nobody freaked out completely about um, windfall. And so we were able to harvest the apples off the ground and they went and they got processed because there was high temperature and any anything that was problematic would get killed. So it was um, a really incredible thing to be a part of. Unfortunately, it's no longer around because over the course of my lifetime, so many of the trees, the apple trees that were all over the Okanagan landscape, um, all heavily subsidized by irrigation because it's a semi-arid region, they all got cut down as people chased grapes and wines. And we do have a flourishing wine industry there, but I find it infuriating and um, troubling that and ironic that you can make a living growing something that's a complete luxury and somewhat of a problematic product at times for people, alcohol, but you can't make a living growing apples. That is one of the ironies of our globalized food system. Next. So this was some of the infrastructure that existed in the 50s and 60s and 70s back in my home region. There were all kinds of people that had employment opportunities that were seasonal and probably able to adjust to family life, et cetera, sorting apples. So that was a really important part of, that, of the, the supply chain, the value chain of our local fruit industry. But we also had all kinds of other things happening. When I was a kid, I don't know if how many of you have eaten Armstrong cheese, at this point, it's a block of some kind of orange substance that has an interesting cheese-like texture. It's not quite cheese whiz, but it's not the cheese of my childhood. Armstrong cheese, when I was a kid, was incredible. It was really high quality cheese. Of course, I got bought out and made to the product that it is today. But back in those days, there were lots of dairies. So we had cheese plants, we had bottling plants, we had a local ice cream manufacturer. There was all kinds of things in place by each sector. We also had abattoirs all over the place and an abundance of butcher shops. And we even had a rendering plant. How many people have ever been to a rendering plant? Good for you. There's such an important part of taking what is otherwise a waste processing it and, and putting it back into the nutrient cycle of our ecosystems. But the one that we had in my home region got shut down because some fool approved a um, housing development right next to it and they didn't like the smell. So guess who lost? <laughs> next, please. Butcher Boys is where I got my first job out of, out of high school. Our farm was just up the road from them. It was a tiny little corner store. I'm thrilled to say it's still around and being run by the son who was just a kid when I was working there. And it's gotten in a much, much larger. It's still an indep independent grocery store and serving a part of uh, the Okanagan that um, is really lucky to have them. They had a, a butcher's shop in the back. And that's where I learned that a sharp knife is actually the best way not to hurt yourself when handling a knife and that uh, you can and like there's all kinds of opportunities to use a whole animal carcass when it goes to the store and you can have that relationship with the farmer, the animal, the carcass and the people who know enough to, sit, to, to cook something other than hamburger. So that was Butcher Boys, NOCA. Does anyone, has anybody ever heard of NOCA? Stands for the North Okanagan Creamery Association. I was at some talk and somebody put that up and said, who knows what NOCA stands for? And I was like, because <laughs> that was one of our local dairies and that was their, um, it was a, a dairy co-op and they did glass bottles and they actually delivered milk to our farm when I was a kid. So that was all there in the 60s and 70s. I know it, I saw it, I lived it, I ate it. I know it's possible to do again. The business model for that got shredded in the 80s and 90s as we moved into neoliberal capitalism. All of the 
foundations of neoliberal capitalism, which is fundamentally about externalizing the real cost to the planet, to, the, to our food, to everybody involved and everything involved in it, it's coming home. And, and, it's, and we're, we're starting to see the cracks in that otherwise really problematic monolithic food system. And I think it holds a lot of promise for what we can rebuild. So I think the business model for what I've just described to you is becoming much more possible now, just in the last two to three years, than it has been in 30 years of me talking and jumping up and down and saying, we have to do this. I see possibility now. So my talk is about weaving different strands together. I'm now going to make a leap to a rather different um, set of uh, stories. So next slide, please. I think this is a really important slide. The first time I saw it, it blew my mind. And I saw it uh, by my friend Jim McIsaac, who runs the T-Buck Suzuki Foundation, which is a fisheries foundation in, on the Pacific coast. Having been working in food for a long time and also having been mentored by the wonderful Kathleen Neen, who is from Newfoundland, um, we would be talking about food and everybody would be talking about agriculture and she would say, and fish, and fish, and fish, and fish. And so uh, I got even into my head that fish are a really important piece of our food system, our food economies, our cultures our ecosystems. I am a land lover. I don't really have much of a relationship with seafood, but I know it's important. And, and I've been infuriated by the fact that like, if you do a Google search for food system and you look at the images, guess what you'll see? You won't see any fish. You might see a token fish on some big elaborate um, diagram, but fish aren't understood to be food in the food movement. And that's insane. So for me, this diagram is so important because it it shows in stark relief we're mostly about water on this planet there's an abundance there if we manage it properly next slide please anybody know what pifcaf means i'm sure there's a few people here that do good it stands for, oh, that previous image was from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in the States. Um, that picture is done by me and that's on the Pacific um, coast. I apologize, I should have had an East Coast uh, picture, but I didn't have any. Um, so PIFCAF stands for Preserving the Independence of the Inshore Fleet in Canada's Atlantic Fisheries. It's a fisheries policy here in the Atlantic region and when I, um, I didn't, I still don't really know much about fish, but I know a lot about policy. So I got dragged into working on fisheries policy about uh, six or eight years ago. And I was floored when I read about PIFCAF because it's an extraordinary statement of, we believe in the importance of fisheries, but more important, we believe in the importance of independent fish harvesters who have the ability to make a livelihood. And we believe in the importance of coastal communities. They have a right to exist. We don't have to drive everybody to living in cities. That's not the solution for the planet. So to me, PIFGAF is an extraordinary, forward-looking, well-grounded piece of policy. Like any government policy, well, any law, there's always a possibility for it to have flaws and for people to find ways to do work around. And so it's an evolving piece of policy. Um, it probably, I haven't actually assessed it for this and for that, I apologize. It's probably racist and doesn't adequately acknowledge um, the indigenous people's fish, fishing rights and needs here. But I do think that it's really important. And the other thing that is astonishing that may be a useful just sort of random piece of information for a trivial pursuit or something is here in the Atlantic region, you can only have fish quota and a license to fish if you're actually an active fish harvester. That is so important. And does that seem sensible to people? In the Pacific region, that's not the case. Most quota and licenses in the Pacific region are held by people for speculative investment. Just think about housing. We know what happens when speculative investment happens. The price does this. So most fish harvesters spend up to 90% of their um, take home 
paying, paying who over, whoever owns the quota and the license. That's absolutely ridiculous. And it's causing huge harm to coastal communities, but also to the fish harvesters because they're compromising on safety. They're compromising on crews. They're chasing a catch when it's not safe in order to try and make enough income to pay a ridiculous <laughs> debt to somebody who's just shoving money into the Cayman Islands or something ridiculous like that. I tell you this because it means that policy, even national policy, is not monolithic. It's being applied differently in different parts of the country. And that, to me, like it's a lesson in a really, really bad policy that has to be changed and that can be changed. Next quote, or next slide, geez. I think this is actually really important, and I think it is actually. I, I understand why she cries. I can't imagine what it is to lose a food that's so foundational to your identity and your nourishment and your household and your economy. I learned a lot from Kathleen. What this points to is a massive mismanagement by government of a resource of a fish, of a species. The problem is that fish harvesters, like many far farmers, are stuck in a cancerous paradigm of growth, of endless accumulation, of endless harvesting. Bigger is better, monocrop, monospecies. It sets us up for that kind of tragedy. And it's so wrong-headed because we all know we're living on a finite planet. We learned that when those three astronauts landed on the moon and sent us back this picture of this like perfect little blue globe in the universe. And we've forgotten that we're finite. And so we keep thinking that a measure of our well-being is growth, whether it's GDP or a larger catch, and it doesn't make any sense. Next slide, please. So um, I have a sort of a love-hate relationship with academics, and I've just become one, so I guess I get, better get over that. But part of the reason I have a love-hate relationship is because so often they use language that's just silly or opaque, and it keeps so many of us out of the conversation. And when I started hearing academics using the language of problematize, I was like, what the heck is that? But it is kind of useful. So is anyone here familiar with the, with the notion of the tragedy of the commons? It's a silly, silly idea. Um, it, was, it was first coined uh, a quite a few years ago, like over a century, and then um, made more popular by economist Garrett Hardin. And basically the underlying understanding is that if you have a bunch of people all sharing something in common, they're all going to be so self-serving that they are going to inevitably destroy whatever that is. And they were, they were thinking about, like, it, before they enclosed all the open land in the UK, people used to be able to graze their animals all over the place. And when they enclosed them, they were like, these people aren't going to cooperate. They're just going to maximize how many of the animals they put on it. They're going to destroy that option for feeding themselves and their animals, etc. I think that um, Garrett Hardin and by popularizing the tragedy as commons has done us a great disservice because it's, it's, a, it's a facile response to how people and species live together, but it rang true with too many policymakers. And that has really influenced how we manage the landscape in policy. So I think it's really important to not take that as truth. And there are other economists like Eleanor, Eleanor Ostrom, whom some of you may know, who've said, no, that's bunkum. They actually can figure this out. And we actually don't have to look too far to different communities and cultures where they have figured out how to live together and each survive and do well. And I think coming from such a large family, like cooperative, collaborative living, sharing space is just kind of deeply ingrained and I know it can be done. So I think instead of talking about the tragedy of the commons, we should all be talking about the tragedy of neoliberal capitalism. Okay. 
Next slide. So this is the other strand in my story today. I, um, I didn't intend to become a food policy analyst. Um, I didn't even really intend to work in food systems. It just sort of happened that way. But I started hanging out with farmers. Like I, I was doing all this food education at a health food store I was working at. And, um, and people were asking me questions about food and local food and farmers. And I thought, well, I should figure that out. So I started hanging out with local farmers. And very early on, I learned none of them knew how to type up minutes. So I started doing that, um, how to write letters to the government when they were having problems. And, and then also listening to the conversations, I learned that they were finding their ability to farm being impacted, being curtailed, being really um, made more challenging by decisions taken by somebody far away who had no understanding of their farm, their ecosystem, their business model, their family needs, anything. And so that's what got me interested in systems and policy. And so because I've always actually wanted to, I've always really been interested in source material. I don't like to necessarily take someone's um, assurance that what they're telling me is true, I'd rather go and read the original thing. And sometimes they match up and often they don't. And when it comes to policy, so often there's a complete mismatch with how it's manifested, how it's implemented and what it actually says in the legislation or, or the policy. And so I started reading things. It started actually with me reading the organic standards. And once you, if you can read the organic standards, you can probably read pretty much anything. And, <laughs> and so I started reading all kinds of policy and helping people navigate that realm and know where there was opportunity to say, no, actually that's a misinterpretation of that particular piece, or this is a piece that's really problematic and we need to change. And because of my policy expertise, um, which I have no training in. I have absolutely no training in anything I've ever done, um, but I do it anyway. Um, I kept getting asked to work on different different policy challenges. So I worked with uh, in the meat sector for six years very closely working on meat policy. And then I ended up working in um, fisheries, as I said. And more recently, I started working in cannabis, which I'd never been exposed to before and was really fascinating to work in. But as I developed this um, expertise in policy, I became increasingly and acutely aware that I was an expert in policy of a settler colonial government that was doing so much harm, and I was deeply implicated in it. So. Actually, going back to 2001, I'm one of the founders of the BC Food Systems Network, and we started meeting in 1999. And actually, by 2000, we were like, we need Indigenous people here. We need to learn from them. We need to know where we are. And so I've had the privilege for over 20 years of being able to spend time with and listen to Indigenous people. And um, over the years, I've learned a lot. But more recently, in the last decade or so, I really took the call from racialized people of all colors, but Indigenous people in particular, to educate myself. I am part of white supremacy. My very existence perpetuates this myth that we're somehow superior. And um, as a settler on in Canada, I'm deeply implicated in all the harms that our nation, our state has been um, doing for far too long. So if you don't know about Terra Nullius, it's a doctrine put out by a Pope of the Catholic Church saying, if they're not Christian, they don't exist. That land is empty and you can do whatever you want with it. And then the associated piece was the doctrine of discovery. If you were the first there, to plant your stake, like stakeholders is a problematic word for a lot of indigenous people, because think of what it says. If you're the first person there, first in, you got to say this is part, this is part of Portugal or Spain or England or whatever, and or France. And it was, both of them are patently false and patently ridiculous. Terra Nullius in particular, like we still really struggle with how much we've been indoctrinated by the notion of Terra Nullius. 
people struggle with the language of indigenous food systems and agriculture because we think of agriculture as legitimately as an aggressive management and ultimately destruction of an ecosystem to impose what kind of food we want on that ecosystem. There are much better ways to live on the planet. And indigenous people, as um, Charlotte Cote, who is uh, New Chalmuth and, and teaches over in, at Washington, in Washington State, she talked about how they engineered their landscapes to meet their needs. And one of the things that they're discovering on the um, Pacific Coast, well, they're, not, they're rediscovering and um, celebrating and rebuilding, they've got these clam gardens up and down the Pacific Coast that are extraordinary feats of engineering. And what they're discovering is like when the water would, goes out, you could see these walls of rocks that have been built because that's where so much life would establish and they could go and harvest their foods. As they're learning more about these clam gardens, they're realizing that they must have, like, like so many Indigenous communities, different clans, different families would have had different responsibilities and different skills that would have been built. People must have been training with weights of some sort to spend a ton of time deep underwater in order to be able to build them. Some of them are so deep and established. It's mind boggling. So this stupid notion that we white folks have that indigenous people only ate if they stumbled across food or a fish jumped into their boat is patently false. And one of the other things I remember reading a long time ago, and this may not be scientifically validated, but I remember reading that when actually Columbus stumbled across what he thought was India, the indigenous people on Turtle Island were the tallest on the planet. And think about the art that flourished. You can only be tall and have a thriving culture when you are well nourished, when your communities are doing well. We had so many stupid false assumptions in an arrogance in establishing this state. Next slide. I'm going to try really hard not to cry. I was at a conference a number of years ago when James Daszak uh, introduced that book, Clearing the Plains. And over the years, I spent a lot of time looking at that man's face. There's, uh, if, you, if you were to Google this, you can see a full picture without the words in front. And um, the, the outrageous genocidal practices that were manifested in so many ways, they're countless and they're outrageous and they're so wrong. I used to talk about how proud I was. My father's family left Europe probably because they really needed to find some new options. And they made their way up to Saskatchewan. And my great grandfather was a stonemason and a water diviner. I think that's really cool. And in fact, all the stonemason work around Halifax is blowing my mind, the skill and the hands of the people that built all those buildings and those walls. That's an incredible skill. Because he was a stonemason, they arrived, I think, in Saskatchewan in 1901 or 19, somewhere around then. And they were, because they'd cleared the plains and they were white and European, they could go out and choose land. And my grandfather chose the land that they ended up building a farm on because he could see from the rocks on it that the, that the soil would be healthy and good. After I heard James talk about this book, and I do own it, and I haven't been able to read it because I can't bear. <sighs> the sorrow, I did this. I told the story of my father's family and their farm, and I cried because I'm implicated 100% in the clearing of the plains.
in BC, where I'm from, this book, Resettling the Range, it's not as well known as James Daszak's book. It's written by John Thistle. He's at UBC. And he traces the story of Indigenous harms in the province I'm from, essentially driven by the cattle industry. So when the reserves were set up in British Columbia, they had a reasonable, not reasonable, they had a, a quota, so much land per body, and that, and then you had to be on this reserve, and the Indian agent made sure that you didn't leave it unless you had permission, et cetera, et cetera. But over time, the cattle industry started to get more and more established in BC. And why were they wasting all that good rangeland on a bunch of Indians? And so they made the reserves smaller and they made them smaller. And then the cattle, were, cattle ranches were saying, well, you know, there's all those damn wild horses and they're eating feed that our cattle need. And so they put out a bounty on the wild horses, which were a critical part of the indigenous people's life economies, culture, and they paid for every pair of horses ears that were turned in. It's not quite as atrocious as a scalping that happened here, but it's, it's horrible. And then after that, the ranchers again said, all those damn grasshoppers are eating too much cattle feed. And so they put DDT all over the landscape that Indigenous people need for their life ways. That's what happened in my province to essentially uh, exterminate, control, corral Indigenous people all because of the cattle industry and the priorities of settlers. I also want to point out the irony I don't know if you probably can't read it. Sorry, I must blow my nose. This book, it's the winner of the Sir John A. Macdonald Prize. It's hard to imagine anything more ironic. Next slide, please. <laughs> So because I'm a policy nerd, I, I know somewhat about these. These are Supreme Court of Canada rulings and just a small fraction of all of the in efforts by Indigenous nations across this country to have their rights um, recognized. So now I want you to close your eyes for a minute and imagine something. You've achieved the North American middle class dream of you've bought your first home and you're starting your family. It's got a picket fence, there's space in the back for a garden, there's a fruit tree, there's a tree you can climb in. You start a family, you're happy and healthy and well. One day, some people come by and they're obviously not doing really well and they don't know the local place. And so you invite them in and you feed them dinner. And then clearly they don't have someplace to stay. So you say, well, you know, we've got a spare room and the kids can bunk up. So why don't you stay in the spare room? So they do. And then that night turns into a week and then a month. And then somehow, suddenly it, be it changes. The whole nature of that relationship changes. And one day you find yourself locked out of your own home and you can't be there anymore. And they've taken over your place and their people are eating from your garden and eating your fruit and living in your home. I'm guessing you can all, you all know what I'm getting at here. But what would it feel like if in order for you to try and get your house back, you had to go talk to those people's parents and said, that was my house, I want it back. What do you think the chances are that they're gonna be very sympathetic to you? That is the circumstance we put indigenous people in. It doesn't make any sense to me that indigenous people have to go to our legal structures when theirs pre-existed ours by millennia and say, that's how you obtain your rights because 
ultimately it's might is right. We're more powerful. We don't care that you were here first. We don't care that you have you have your own laws and practices and cultures. You have to come and get our permission. So that in and of itself is atrocious, but more than that, so many of these have been big wins, wins for indigenous people, and they aren't yet moving the Canadian state to actually enabling much in the way of their real rights and responsibilities to their own territories. Next slide, please. I don't really have any good pictures of fish. So this is of a something on the road that I really enjoyed. Um, so the right to moderate livelihood fishery is one of those things where the Mi'kmaq Marshall Jr. went to the Supreme Court of Canada and said, I should have a right to fish. And more than 20 years ago, I think it was 1999, he won, he made the point in the Supreme Court of Canada that you have a right to a moderate livelihood. I don't know who defines what a moderate livelihood and I don't know why the Canadian state should be able to say that, but the fact that we granted that um, as the Canadian state was a step forward. But what is appalling is it's been 23 years and they still don't have that. I had the pleasure of reading a PhD thesis by Mi'kmaq scholar Shelley Denny, who works in fisheries here. It's an amazing thesis. I learned a lot. Some of it's way too technical and kind of blew my mind. But the thing that also blew my mind is I can't, if I was an Indigenous person, I would have kicked us off a long time ago. <laughs> Find a different part of the planet. I have been so privileged in relationships and conversations with so many Indigenous people and read so many different um, articles and books and the generosity and, and willingness to tolerate our presence here, if only we could just do it better, is amazing. And Shelley Denny continues that that um, approach. And she draws on um, Elder Albert Marshall's notion of two-eyed seeing, which is also similar to the notion I mentioned last night or the notion, but the treaty of the, the two-row wampum, where you live side by side respectfully and you don't do harm to each other. And But two-eyed seeing kind of takes that a little step further in that it, it unites the best of each knowledge and brings it together into everyone doing better. And um, I don't. Uh, I know that the next step, she Shelley Denny's um, PhD thesis was accepted just earlier this year. And I know she works in fisheries um, management here in Mi'kma'ki. Um, her proposal was for a, a new way of finding a common ground between settler and indigenous fish harvesters and a co-management um, model that would allow all to safely and appropriately uh, harvest fish. Her proposal is that now it needs to be um, piloted. And I really would love to see something like that happen because it, it broke my heart reading in her thesis about how one of the quotes she did from interviewing uh, different indigenous or Mi'kmaq fish harvesters was, I just want to be able to fish when it's light in order to be safely out on the water. And like it's safe on the water in the dark, hello, but it's safer to be out in on the water in the dark, subject to whatever the weather and conditions are going to throw at you than to be out there in the light when settler fish harvesters are going to do damage to you and your equipment. And I'm sure you're all aware of the level of violence that's happened here. Can you imagine what would happen if all of us settlers really got on board and said, DFO, get your shit together. Moderate livelihood is a bare bones minimum of what we should be lying, Mi'kmaq fishers. Next slide, please. So I've been loving all the rock walls. So this is my brick wall. We run into brick walls. The structural issues are real. Uh, the cultural problems, the policy problems, the infrastructure and the, how we've been normalized to be thinking about cheap food and that we should have everything every season of the year and never have any kind of differentiation. Those are all real issues. 
And I think it's important. Um, I've been to far too many conferences and uh, where everybody wants some bright, shiny, squeaky clean model of how to make it work that they can take back to their community. And it, it, there is no one answer. There is no one model, but we can learn together. So next slide, please. Oh, I forgot about this one. I, um, I had the privilege of hiking down into the Grand Canyon in 2019, and I was lying in the tent um, at the bottom of the canyon in the middle of the night fretting about climate change. And um, it caused me to lose my mind, and I ran for the Green Party in the 2019 uh, federal election. I'm never going to do that again. I am not a self-promoter. I think that's a, an essential characteristic for some reason of our politicians. Um, but I would never have done anything so far out of my comfort zone. I don't even like public speaking. Um, if I hadn't been so deathly afraid and deeply, deeply concerned about the climate crisis that the planet is on, we owe so much to all the other species, the ones that are going extinct, to our next generations. We've done so much harm. In BC, I'm sure some of you saw the news of the atmospheric rivers last fall, last November, that, that did so much damage. I live, I happily live in the hinterlands of BC. When I tell people I'm from BC, they're like, oh, you guys don't get any snow in Vancouver, do you? I don't live in Vancouver. I live halfway between Calgary and Vancouver. When those, when that huge rainfall happened and the flooding and the, and the uh, mudslides, it literally cut 90% of the province off from our main conduit of food. It was a huge wake up call. When I used to do talks back in the, in the 90s, it's like, do you remember that winter when we did nothing but shovel? I was trying to get people to think about what extreme weather could do and how it could compromise our food supply. I don't need to do that anymore. Everybody in BC knows about um, that challenge. The crazy thing is, and this goes back again to how we, we are so, um, problematic, shall we say, with how we, we treat Indigenous people. The, uh, I believe, is the Stolo that live in the Squamish, in the um, Sumas Prairie area. And a hundred or so years ago, they decided to drain a lake and riparian area that was a critical part of how they lived because there was rich soil under that. And so they did that. They put up some dikes that obviously failed and will fail. And they concentrated way too much agriculture in that valley bottom there. It's convenient, you can bring grain in, you can feed the far too many animals that are there, you can ship food out. Um, it made good sense for, in some ways, but that concentration made us so incredibly vulnerable in the rest of the province. There was no way to get food out. The thing that's more appalling and why I've been working with, um, in meat systems for a really long time is I'm adamantly opposed to large scale meat production. I think animal protein produced that way is absolutely unethical, inhumane, immoral, everything wrong. And particularly because so many of those animals are chained or locked up in some way they can't move. As a result of the flooding in Sumas Lake, 630,000 animals died. Most of them, well, not most of them, lots of them poultry. Pigs are amazing animals. They're sentient, they're intelligent, they're, they're wonderful. How we treat them, how we produce um, pork and ham and bacon is appalling. And most of those animals would have been chained on their sides in a little crate on concrete that they spent their whole life in and then they drowned on top of that. There's something really wrong with how we do food. There's something really wrong with how it's contributed to climate change. So we have to change things up. <laughs> Next slide, please. So as I said earlier, there's little glimmers of hope. Does everybody remember when this boat went sideways in the Suez Corral? I thought it was fabulous. 
we need events like that to wake up people that don't that have no imagination to think out of business outside of business as usual that boat was carrying can you believe this 3.5 billion dollars us in product in that one boat and do you know how many boats were stuck behind it for six weeks for six days almost a full week it's ridiculous and so much of that product is the crap that people buy and then get rid of i have to go fast um so <laughs> this is good good news we're going to change this next slide please so we can put humpty dumpty back together again but Humpty Dumpty wasn't just one egg. It doesn't. Need, it needs to not just be one egg. We need a diversity of eggs of species. Planting them, or grow, uh, hatching them. <laughs> we can do this better. Um, onshoring is happening. It used to be all about offshoring everything. Well, now we're bringing it back home. We're learning how to rebuild our infrastructure and our skills, and excitement about doing for ourselves. Um, I think we better carry on. Next one. Okay, so I'm supposed to give you a few exciting positive examples. Tea Creek Farm is run by Jacob Beaton and his partner Jessica. It's only two years in, it's up in Gitsan territory in my home province. They've had this incredible impact. The next slide has the list. Next slide. Most of you won't be able to read this, but they've had unbelievable impact in such a short time. It's indigenous led, it's indigenous focused, they produced a, a crazy amount of food, which is astonishing to do in a two year farm and and given it all out to indigenous communities nearby. They're helping people with apprenticeships, they're bringing all kinds of people in giving them basic skills. They've served 7,000 hot meals just this year. Like, it's amazing what they're doing. They, because they're hampered by the Indian Act, can't get the kind of funding that they would like to, and so they're always scrambling to fund their activities. And if you go on their website, a lot of what they do is only partially or not funded, but they do it because they know it's important. Tea Creek is an amazing, it's just teacreek.ca. I'd encourage anyone to go take a look at it. Next slide, please. So this is my beloved Kootenai Co-op. I've been involved with it for 32 years. I was on the board for 14 years. We started, it started as a food buying club. We've had incredible success. We just kept growing. People cared about us and they wanted us to be in the downtown core of Nelson. If you go to Nelson, BC, it's one of the only cities in on this continent where the downtown core is thriving. And it's because the co-op has essentially been the anchor tenant, so to speak, of our downtown core. So there's all kinds of independent businesses on a street that's full of people. It's wonderful. Next slide. So this is what we did last year. We had, I can't read, 26 million in sales. 3.6 million of that went to our local suppliers. We have well in excess of 100 local suppliers. When that um, atmospheric river cut off BC from food, the co-op just called all our local suppliers and said, how are you doing? You good? Yeah, we're good. So our store shelves were fine. Down the street at Safeway and Sobeys and all those other places, they were scrambling to figure out, oh, how can we get food from Calgary now? So we've had a huge impact. We've got a hundred and some 160, I think, staff. They're well paid. They're, we really believe in a, in a living wage for our suppliers as well as the people that work there. And we're very involved in the local community. Six of our 20 largest suppliers, and I'm talking potato chips and soy milk and all those other things that are sold at health food stores and are definitely not local. Six out of our 20 are local suppliers, which is pretty amazing. Next slide, please. This is in Saskatchewan, in Treaty 6 and 8 territory, I believe. Farmers and ranchers there are making agreement with Indigenous communities to share the land, to enable them to come on and have access and do the things that they want and need to do on their territories. And I think it's a really wonderful um, model of how we should all be making space and recognizing rightly should be on that land. Next slide, please. This is CAPE, the Cooperative for l'Agriculture de Proximité Écologique, and it's this amazing cooperative in Quebec of farmers who really want, they're committed to sustainable agriculture, they're committed to agriculture that feeds people in their community, that feeds it close by. And I really love that that's happening. Next slide. 
Uh, this is the Silks Okanagan Nation Alliance. They have been working really hard to reintroduce uh, fish into their waterways and particularly to overcome all of the barriers on the Columbia River system in order to enable the salmon to return. In my part of the province, which is just east, there are no salmon anywhere near any of the Indigenous communities for which it's an unbelievable tragedy and, and wrong in so many ways. So it's really heartening to see that the Okanagan Nation Alliance, is, which is working across the Canadian US border in order to restore fish and they've got their own hatchery and it's been a real success and it's bringing fish back to their people. Next slide, please. And back here in the Atlantic provinces, my friend Troy Mitchell, he's from Twillingate. Um, I love the fact that like he did this geocaching or something like that to identify all of the root cellars just in Twillingate. Twillingate is this tiny little fishing community in northern Newfoundland. They've got 234 root cellars in that community and you can go and tour them. And the thing that's amazing is like lots of parts of the Atlantic region apparently, it, Newfoundland's on a rock. You can't build a root cellar like you would in my province, which is you dig down. So they create them on top of that rock, sod it so that it's insulated, and they've been storing food there for like 200 plus years. That is not just an indication of amazing creativity, perseverance, but that it can be done. We can feed ourselves from here if we know how to do it. And there's still a lot of knowledge, a lot of good hearts and ways to learn from each other. Last slide, please. I'm actually just gonna skip this one. There's lots of other great models you can talk about at some other time if you want. And the last slide, please. So there's no simple answer, there's no one way, but by learning together, working together and having a clear vision of healthy ecosystems, healthy foods, just being fairly in the places where we are, I think we can do marvels. Thank you. When Amber and I talked last night about me doing her bio, she's like, please just make it simple. Farmer, like agriculture, do it simply. Just one thing before I, I do a final thank you for Abra. Uh, I know you probably have a lot of questions for her. We don't have time right now, but we are transitioning right into a regional dialogue. And the other thing I wanted to say is, I think Bob set me up because I am an economist, um, but I'm, not, I'm part of the resistance. I'm an ecological economist who worked with the Canadian Ecological um, Economic society and we've actually been working with indigenous people for what is being called indigenomics so taking back in economics and giving it indigenous principles so what i would say is get to know an economist and try to help train them in a, in a more sustainable way and with that let's just one more round of applause to abra <laughs> So we're going to do a quick transition. Our volunteers are going to come up. We're going to set up for the regional dialogue, which means we're going to get rid of the podium, bring up some, um, some microphones. And I would just ask for the regional group that's coming up with Dan and, and everybody else. If you want to come up, we'll get ready to get set up with you. So this is going to be a quick transition, maybe a quick coffee, but don't go too far away because we're starting in about five minutes. Oh, and I'll be around all weekend. Sorry that I took too much time. If you have questions, you can find me. Oh, it's perfect. No, it's perfect. Okay, well then. And Dan. And Dan. Talking from here, or are we using microphones? Oh, okay. All right. All right. Well, that'll help. 
Okay. Yes, and I and I'm gonna be. Why do you need it? Like if we're gonna be going up there and down, I can just stay off by the side. Yeah, I'm not. Is he doing the Q and A? I'm gonna let him finish. Yeah, I'm gonna let him finish. Oh really? Who are the two? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Here. Okay. At the panel up there. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, you sit here, Amber sits there, and you can use this mic. Okay. Art's saying as close as we can get over there. There's a water thing underneath the desk. If they, yeah, if, if, if you want to share that, you guys can use it. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thanks, Natalie. Yeah, yeah. Do the intro. Okay, just, I'll use a microphone. Okay. Testing, testing. Hello, Linda. How are you today? Where are you going? I remember. All right, excellent. I'll, let, I'll walk you over here. Let's go. Please have a seat, everyone. Uh, you know what? We'll have, we'll have to go to the list of registration. Yes. Okay, everybody, we're going to get started. We're missing some panelists, though. I don't know. We Heather's yeah, we got Heather. Where's Letitia? Have we seen Letitia? Hi everyone. We're missing a couple panelists, speakers. Heather. We got behind us. 
We need Leticia and Philip up here, please. And Catherine. If you find a speaker, there's a prize. Not these ones, though. We've got them already. Tom, do you have a speaker with you? Okay. Where do you want to see the I don't know. I think I'm have you seen Philip today? As a kind of a, a moderator. Okay. I think you're sitting there. Okay. I didn't see and I think the today. panel are on the stage. At least that's okay. what Bob said. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All three of you up on the stage. Yeah, we, we don't know where everyone else is. Okay, we're going to get started in one minute. We're missing three speakers, so we're hoping they come. All right. If anyone knows where Philip is, or Leticia, or Catherine, free prize. Oh, we got Philip. Actually, yeah. All right. Perfect. Okay, so we're going to get started, everyone. Yeah. Uh, do we have Catherine? This is Catherine Carey, right? This is a regional dialogue. This is just a discussion. Like Dan, you're off the stage. You've been, you've been shunted. Catherine's taking your spot. I didn't know. <laughs> and do you know, and does anyone here know Leticia? Leticia, what's that? Leticia. Leticia. All right, everyone, we're going to get started. I'm just going to put this there. Good after, no, good morning, good morning, good morning. If you can hear me, put up your hand. If you can hear me, put up your hand. If you can hear me, put up your hand. Thank you, everybody. All right, so we're going to get started. Um, I'm, I'm, we don't want to have me talking too long, so what I'm going to do is do a quick introduction. This is the first of our, or second of our regional dialogues, and it's Rebuilding the Atlantic Canada Food Shed. Rebuilding a robust network regional food system requiring, requires reskilling, investments of time and funding, key infrastructure, and facilitating policy. Some things we just heard about when we were listening to ABRA. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce, uh, briefly introduce our uh, group, our, our established regional people. Um, uh, it's gonna be Abra, Philip, Leticia is not here yet, but if someone finds her, send her up to the front. Heather, Dan, and Catherine. So I don't need to introduce Abra again, because you we just talked to Abra. And those of you that were here last night to hear Philip know that, oh, he's another one I've done a podcast with for the Center of Local Prosperity. So again, another reason to go to the website. He has bringing us an international lens to the topic of rebuilding regional food systems. He works closely with groups in the US and abroad on the complex weaving of multiple aspects of regional food-wide systems, and is the founder and executive director of Regem by Design, a new education, media, and research organization that is focused on regenerative communities with food and agriculture at the center. Heather Lunen is originally from Montreal, the seeds of where she got her curiosity about food, uh, developed a strong food foundation where diet, health, community, and entrepreneurship all played a role, and is creating pathways to food system change by connecting farm, food, and people at the station, and it's in the culmination of all of her life's work. For Dan Rubin, who I'm trying to block here, uh, Dan retired as a teacher, curriculum developer, and principal in 2002, but has founded the Food Producers Forum, which is a provincial nonprofit in Newfoundland. Uh, he focuses on enhancing local food production as a primary strategy for restoring regional food security. In Newfoundland, he's been involved in local food producer as a gardener, garden educator, author, and activist. And he launched Perfectly Perennial, a heritage seed company that is focused on locally adapted plants and has led a number of annual workshops. Catherine, who thought she was speaking tomorrow, but thank God we got her today too, uh, is the community food coordinator at the North Grove. North Grove increases, increases food security through opportunities for social connection, communal spaces to grow food, and engaging outdoor education. 
It's a community hub in the heart of Dartmouth, Dartmouth North, excuse me. Uh, she runs the farm with a group of dedicated community volunteers and small scale urban farmers. And she has a week, they have a weekly uh, produce market with a mixture of low cost and free items, which is vital to the community who live in the low income food desert of Dartmouth North. Without further ado, I'm gonna give this back and let Dan be the moderator. Hi. Like uh, Abra, I'm a transplanted BC person. I lived for 30 years on an off-grid island north of Vancouver, where I had to dig my own well. Uh, I wrote a book with solar panels on the roof providing power. And you learn things when you live in a place which I used to call more about truck repair than you ever wanted to know. <laughs> And like Abra, I have memories of wonderful local food when I first lived in Vancouver in the 1970s and worked as an advisor to regional district planners. I don't call them planners anymore, I call them plumbers, because all they do is connect the pipes. <laughs> I used to drive past a dairy uh, uh, before I headed out to Mission and stopped for my bottle of raw milk. Oh my God, that was good, the cream on the top. I don't know about you, I took six pages of notes while Abra was speaking. And I love her stories because they're signposts on the road that we need to travel. So we're gonna have a time for questions at the end of this, I'll be the timekeeper. And I think we'll just let each of these people speak and tell us their reflections, having sat and listened to what we just heard. So, well, I'm not going to start because I wasn't sure I was on this panel. Ah, we've just added you. Perhaps Heather, and I know Heather just from an online meeting, and I know about the wonderful work that the Food Hub is doing in creating processing space for entrepreneurs. So perhaps Heather would go first. Thank you, Dan. Um, <clears throat> I'm feeling a little like a fish out of water here, I must say. <clears throat> um, so Rebecca Tran and I, partners, uh, purchased the, um, the Newport Station Elementary School three years ago, over three years ago, with the intention of um, uh, impacting in some way the food system in Nova Scotia, recognizing that there was definitely um, <laughs> plenty of room for improvement. Uh, I came from a small retail food business and recognized that there just wasn't enough impact. I didn't feel like I was having enough impact. I wanted to um, find a way to move more Nova Scotia food. So Rebecca and I came together and <clears throat> we were looking for a small place to, um, to start a manufacturing facility where we could purchase from the local producers <clears throat> and in some way get product to the institutions. Um, fast forward, actually just not that <clears throat> a couple of weeks really it was very very quick um we found ourselves the proud owners of a 17,000 square foot retired school that had been opened in 1963 and so therefore with it came all the glories of a building that had been opened in 1963. um in three years uh we've <laughs> managed to turn it into a place where we share space with two other businesses. We have been able to develop a manufacturing facility. We, as of the front end of this year, we are helping to provide seasoned mashed potatoes, our, our anchor product to um, <clears throat> patients through the Nova Scotia um, Health Program. Um, so up to date, we have served 360,000 portions of mashed potatoes to patients in our hospitals. I love the idea that it was, it, it's actually through the, the humble potato that we've made these in ways. It's, uh, I think it's very symbolic. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot, there's a lot to do. These, these, these processes don't uh, happen easily. We were in conversation with, with Nova Scotia Health for a year every two weeks to, to make this happen. We're talking about 
mashed potatoes. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it takes the time that it takes. Um, huge cultural shift for me because I have been an entrepreneur for a long time. And if there's a problem with what's going on, you tell me in the morning by the afternoon, we have it turned around and we're working on something else. It's not how the big institutions work. Um, that has been a huge piece for me to understand, which I still struggle with, but it's real and it's part of what has to be incorporated into the understanding of getting food into institutions. There are all kinds of barriers that have been faced um, in getting local food into uh, institutions and we're working at building the confidence because I think it takes a lot of confidence on the part of institutions to trust that our producers can in fact provide them with a year round product, uh, that it's going to be consistent, that it's going to be safe, all of these things. That's not to say that there aren't all kinds of crazy um, challenges in making that happen. And one of our <clears throat> big challenges is that we struggle to be able to use the product from our very local producers. We have, we, have, we have big firms from which we pr uh, purchase our, our, our product, our suppliers. Uh, we will have product. But there are the smaller producers that we haven't yet found a way because many of the small producers do not have the standards that are required by um, the likes of Gordon Food Services. So we, we actually, our customer is actually Gordon Food Services and they manage the health pro program. <laughs> Excuse me. So, um, so these are some of the things that we're trying to work with. We've we had conversation over the winter last year to to see if we could figure out how to get some producers gathered together and maybe get a common body that would hold the registration or the all the certification, and then they would feed into it, um, so that the cost isn't so ridiculously out of out of reach. Um, so. Work in progress. Without a doubt, three years in, we've got potatoes on the plates of patients. Super excited about that. Looking at developing a second anchor product just to, from a business perspective, because all of the, I love to speak from a place of, um, of, of philosophy and, you know, <clears throat> figuratively and all that. But it, there, there has to, it, it has to make business sense as well. And um, so we're, we're trying to figure out that piece as well. So we're looking at, at a second anchor product, as it were, <clears throat> so that we can have some kind of balance and, you know, how, how that works in business, you know. Heather, I'm yes. going to interrupt yeah. you to say we have limited time. Yeah. And I, ask you to pass the mic on to, to Philip uh, so that we can also leave time at the end for questions. You bet. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Well, and, <clears throat> you know, Avril, it was really phenomenal talk. And I think it's so critical because so much of what happens, I, I think, as all of us get into this work, we get embedded in our notions of what the realities are and forget to check our ourselves, our assumptions, our kind of analyses. And they're just always these stones that we need to turn over and, and take the time to, to look at and think about. And, um, you know, I think for myself coming from the, the South originally in North Carolina, um, you know, there was um, the racial disparities uh, that, that were so much there, there's still so much a part of it um, with the African American communities and now the Hispanic community moving in. And we, we just, we always have to find these ways to check our assumptions. And so really appreciated what, what you're saying there. And, um, you know, we, we fall into these traps. So I think these reminders are so critical, you know, of, of the work that we're doing. And when we look along the value chain and we really try to assess and one of the, those stones that doesn't get unturned often enough, at least in the United States is the middle of the food system and what's happening there. And you brought out the processing piece and the inequities that so often appear, you know, in that processing sector. Um, which, you know, there are ways that we can find to avoid that. And I think the smaller the value chain, the shorter the distance, then the better the hope that we get it right. And I think that's one of the beauties of it is 
How do we shorten that value chain while also recognizing there is always that middle and those are also the things we need to check. And one of the things that I've wondered about also is as you all think about the fishing industry um, in writing, rebuilding the food shed and thinking about in particular meat processing. And so many of the things that happen within the, the middle of that sector with the, the processing, um, you know, the, the only place where it can be maybe more challenging is when that processing is offshore and it's even more hidden. And then, you know, the AP did a really fantastic um, kind of review of that a couple of years ago, bringing that out. So I hope that that's also one of the things that might be there in the discussion is the processing that happens in that regard with the seafood sector. Yes, pass the mic along. Um, to me? Yes. <laughs> um, so my name's Catherine. I'm also a BC transplant. <laughs> Something about that. Um, uh, so I'm working in a, a nonprofit uh, community food center in Dartmouth North, really urban area. So pretty different, again, from what everybody else is doing. Um, but uh, yeah, so we have a small urban farm. Um, we produce food with... Uh, incredible volunteers um, and we use that food that food gets given away to the community at our weekly food market um, it gets used in our meals we serve 500 meals a week to the community um, I think that the the key piece that that I really see in my work is that the people who are kind of at the front lines of food security work of anti-poverty work are the people living in poverty themselves um, they're the ones who are finding the resourcefulness to feed their families, check on their neighbors, check on their friends. Um, they're the ones who are connecting other people they know who are struggling with resources. Um, and so I really see my role as supporting, supporting those people into, in doing that truly frontline work. Um, uh, yeah, we, you know, we're in the city, but it's still, uh, you know, most of the neighborhood that I'm in is um, very densely populated. Lots of people are in apartments, rental buildings, um, and there's, you know, not really a grocery store within easy walking distance. There's one a few kilometers away, but, you know, and so from a rural area, you're probably thinking, oh, that's pretty close. But, you know, if you don't have a car, if you have mobility issues, it's not super super close by um so we do a weekly affordable market um mostly focusing on produce um we have a great supporter who allows us to subsidize our prices so there are prices that you have not seen in years <laughs> you know 35 cents for a tomato every week um and uh, we always have free items as well we've partnered with a local food bank so that we can always have eggs are always free potatoes are always free onions are always free we have all the stuff that we grow is always free as well so it means that people can come in with um, no money or a dollar and get a couple of bags of groceries um, we do the stuff that we grow is uh, we grow it as to give away for free one because it's grown with the help of volunteers um, so it's grown by the community so it's for the community um, but it also means you know we're growing things like kale and that means, you know, if you have a limited food budget, you're not going to spend your precious $5 of your food budget on trying kale for the first time, because um, it might not be any good, you might not like it, you're not sure how to cook it. But if we're giving it away for free, you're much more likely to incorporate that incorporate that into your diet. And, um, you know, we know that that's really important for nutrition is very diet. So letting people have the opportunity to try new things. Um, uh, it was really important. And um, yeah, I could talk about this for, you know, <laughs> several hours, but I think I'll, I'll just say that and um, pass it along. I'm going to say this. <laughs> uh, we're, we're almost ready to open to questions, so we do want to leave time for that. But I want to point us at the part of what Abra was talking about that hit me in right in my stomach. Uh, I'm very fortunate to have worked for two periods of time with Indigenous elders to develop programs for language renewal. I'm proud to say that the program for some Aliyah, developed with the school district 52 in Prince Rupert, has taught the basics of that language to more than 75,000 children. And in doing that kind of work, you become deeply aware of the issues 
that ABRA is aware of and we're all aware of as settlers. And um, I just want to tell one little story and then I want to ask Abra to speak and then we'll open it to questions. And the story is that in 1989, I was visiting New Zealand where I have connections through a woman named Sylvia Ashton Warner, a teacher who uh, worked with Maori children. And I was driving the car that I bought to get myself to Okarito on the South Island over the mountains to Dunedin. And I picked up a hitchhiker, um, a Pakeha, a white guy. And I asked him at the time about what he thought about the dispute around the Treaty of Waitangi. The treaty was the one that the British Empire signed when they lost the war with the Maoris. But unfortunately, there were two versions of the treaty, one in Maori and one in English, and they did not say the same thing. So I asked this fella who I picked up with a backpack what he thought about the dispute that was really raging at the time in New Zealand. And he answered me in fluent Maori. And I turned around and stared at him. He said, well, it's my language too. So the question I would ask, what will it take for us to get there where we're welcomed into the culture and learning from it? Because so much of what we need to do is particular to place. We have to think in whole systems, but the solutions are local. And the only person who knows better about that than a third or fourth or fifth generation farmer is the indigenous person whose families have lived there for 20,000 years. Abra. Thanks for setting me up. Um, I actually don't know that I've got that much to add to what I already spoke about in my talk with regards to Indigenous people, but when I was trying to wrap my head around the population here, and um, I, I have fought for the underdog basically all my life, and I learned about Africville quite a few years ago and was sadly not surprised, but outraged, absolutely outraged at the story of that community and the way that they're, they were treated throughout. And there have been African Nova Scotians here since before any white folks found the place. And, and so I can't help but think that in addition to the, the indigenous people of the Atlantic provinces, um, there's much to be learned from people from the African Nova Scotians who've been here for hundreds and hundreds of years and adapted their food culture to this place. They weren't walking down the street to the 7-Eleven 200 years ago. What were they cooking? What were they eating? Where were they getting it from? What were their relationships like with the Mi'kma'ki? Those are important questions to ask and answers to seek, but I also was looking at the immigration stats for this region. And there's been a pretty significant influx of immigrants from other parts of the world that have really distinct food cultures and expectations and needs that I think, again, as opposed to being, a, oh, geez, what do we do about them? It's a huge opportunity to learn the joys of new foods and new people and and help them feel that they have a place here, but also it's it's a for any entrepreneur, it's an opportunity. So I do think that it's you know bringing in all the diverse cultures in this place, those that are long here as well as the newer ones, and figuring out how to bring together those synergies to really be able to drive a healthy, vibrant, place-based food system that celebrates the diversity and, and draws on it for the betterment of all is something that there's enormous opportunity here if it's, if it's seen and taken advantage of. The image that comes to mind is an enormous table and we're all sitting around it and someone says, pass the mashed potatoes. Um, putting the pieces back together to create a regional food shed. That's what we're talking about here. And we have the traveling mics and it is time for questions for any members of this panel. Hands. 
there's a hand in the back right there. Uh, woman in a black sweater. Are you the farmer? I, I, yes, I am. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, just, just to start this off about um, opportunities for food system to integrate with indigenous cultures. Um, you guys know I spoke last night, I'm a farmer. I live about uh, half an hour further down the Cobbequid shore. Um, I know that there is um, a, a reserve down in Parsboro, and I know that there's one just past Truro, and I know that there's one sort of like in between Millbrook and the airport. I would love to find ways to learn from Indigenous peoples to, I, I have a farm, it's a, it's a learning farm. I have people come and stay on the farm and learn from the farm and, and integrate with the farm. I would love to invite people from the Indigenous community to come and teach me and to, to just open that door and say, hey, I'm, I'm a, a settler farmer and I live here. How can I build a relationship with you? And I don't know how to start that conversation. Or how do we start the conversation to functionally connect mm -hmm. with Indigenous communities? I, I think here in Nova, or at least for, for me yeah. here in Nova Scotia, our Indigenous communities are very out of sight, out of mind. And so, I mean, I, I know in Parsboro where, where there is, um, uh, it's... Uh, let me cut you off and building. turn that question sure. over to the yeah. panel. Is there somebody who would like to, we're brainstorming now, right? Ways to connect with our indigenous friends. Somebody want to talk to that? Um, I would really challenge you actually, don't expect them to come to your farm, go to them. I have spent I couldn't tell you how many thousands of hours sitting in on around at farm tables and in farm meetings, listening to farmers, going to them. And I think we really need to do the same with Indigenous people. We really, us white folks, have a really hard time understanding how much we're the center of the universe in a really problematic way. And, you know, like... There's all, you can get all kinds of training. There's, there's great training from indigenous people, but also from people of color who are like, you white folks, you got to think about this, 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 in order to figure out how to get past our white supremacy brainwashing. But when you look at, when you, and all these, all these organizations, nonprofits are like with total good heart trying to figure out how do we diversify who works here? How is it that our Brady Bunch image of our staff isn't all white? The thing is, if you look at an organization that is led by people of color, guess what you see in that Brady Bunch picture of staff? They're diverse. They have all different kinds of colors of skin. It's not magic. You have to figure out how to make your space inviting, welcoming, safe. And part of that is figuring out how we question our own white privilege and all the ways we perpetuate. It's subtle and it's awful and it's insidious. And if we understand that the people who are people of color who lead those organizations have totally nailed how to make it welcoming to other people of color, it, I think, brings us some humility in terms of questioning how we approach this. But I think the first and most important thing is to be humble enough to realize what we don't know. And it's not about coming to us, but going to them and using our two ears and not our one mouth to learn. While we Sorry, wish... I didn't mean to be preachy. Yeah. Um, I do agree that we have to be willing to go and meet and we have to be willing to listen. Um, and I've been asked to wrap it up time-wise because uh, there need to be some notes presented about this, but each of these people and all of us and all of you are here, and that's why we're here, is to connect. It's the lack of connectivity, which is the issue. It's the silos, which are our current problem. So uh, we're going to wrap this up. I wish we had time for more questions, and thank our panel.
and I will hand the microphone back to Jillian. Thank you. Oh, I know I'm right in the way. Okay, I'm gonna lose my phone again. This is the third time today. Let me find my notes. So I would like Art, my new best friend, to use the slide so that I don't have to. So what we've done as a planning committee over the last year is wanting to make sure that this conference isn't a one and done, that you don't go home and go, oh, wasn't that great? The food was fantastic and the conversation was inspiring. So what we are trying to do is make sure we're capturing your thoughts, your ideas. And as you can tell from the agenda, it's pretty packed. So you'll notice over by Andrea, who's taking a picture of me. Hi, Andrea. Uh, that there are some uh, flip chart paper. Yes, look at my, my beautiful assistant. Um, and there are five questions. And so we'd like you to take an um, opportunity to think about the five questions. What do you envision for an Atlantic network of food system stakeholders? How would this network help with your work? What programmed policy infrastructure or practices will help the most to be effectively and quickly expand our regional food system? How can we best encourage and support underrepresented groups within our food systems? How can students and the general public gain more awareness of the importance of local food, have increased access to local food, and become more engaged in where it actually comes from? And then finally, as a consumer, as we all are, what is the, our, your greatest obstacle in acquiring local food and what would overcome this obstacle? And because we know people have varying ways of wanting to express themselves, we will take interpretive dance, or uh, there are markers, stickies, and all that over there, so you could do that as well. But I'm, I'm up for an interpretive dance, personally. So, so with that, I just wanna remind you, I know our, you can't see me, but over here, our, our exhibitor tables. So we'd encourage you to come in through this way or the back. I think all of our tables are set up now. A lot of energy has gone into those, so please do. And with, with that, I want to say thank you once again to this wonderful regional dialogue. So thank these guys.